Amen. A quote from one of my all-time favorite adaptations of a classic goes something like this. The Marleys were dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. Dead as a doornail, though I don't know what is particularly dead about a doornail. This you must know, or nothing of what follows will be wonderful. Great quote. Many in our day are consumed with what happens after we check out of this life. What happens next? Little boys who visit heaven get books written and sell millions of them. Movies are made of it. Many documentaries, movies, or whatever that deal with what happens after we leave here are huge uh, in numbers of attendees. Matter of fact, there was some studies done over uh, 75 to 2005, would that be about 30 years? There are over 3,500, and since we're all acronym-oriented around here, NDEs, which is near-death experiences for those who don't have that on their phone. These cases were studied by about 35 different groups of researchers, uh, universities and whatnot. And it's interesting because they had a lot of things that went uh, through all of them, or the majority of them, or at least they experienced, each one of them experienced something on this list, which is kind of interesting. There's, there's this fascination with it, but... Basically, you had things like an out-of-body viewing. They were in the hospital room seeing themselves or their doctors as, as they were leaving. They went through a tunnel or through some sort of darkness and came out on the other side. They knew they were dead. They were greeted by deceased loved ones or, or angelic beings of some sort that were clothed in white. They usually would see light. Many of them saw land on a distant shore. Maybe there was a river between them or some gulf. And it's interesting also that only about 10% of them actually went to the land. They could see it. But not very many got there, and they had feelings of peace and love. It's interesting to me. We want to know what happens after we're done with this life. Just about everybody does, because we know this life is not all there is. There's, there's a fascination with it. Now, Jesus Christ was dead. There was no doubt about that. Multitudes saw it. Trained Roman executioners, who were very good at their job, confirmed it. Yes, he is dead. The loss of blood, we, we watched a little bit of The Passion the other night, and if you've seen that scene where he's taking the cross to uh, the place of the skull, just the lashing that he got with the cat of nine tails and the, and the, and the scourging that he got would be enough to kill someone relatively quickly, uh, if that's even remotely accurate, and I believe it's probably pretty close. The lethal pressure that's put on someone when they are crucified, if you've studied that out or read that, it's amazing what it does to the internal organs. And, uh, and if that was not enough, then a stab in the side into the heart <laughs> certainly confirmed that Jesus Christ was dead. There was no doubt about it. We're celebrating the Resurrection Day today because Jesus Christ not only died on Friday for our sins, but He's alive today. And that has been confirmed by hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses, many of whom suffered and died because of that testimony. And what I want to focus on today is because of the resurrection, we know a lot of what's coming. We know a lot of what's going on and what will happen. It's all over the scripture. We know that in Revelation, for example, when John is having this vision and he, and he steps into heaven, a different realm than you and I are currently in, he meets the Lord and the Lord says to him, Fear not, I'm the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys to death in Hades or hell. I have those. When you read through the gospel accounts, you read through the New Testament, we get a glimpse of what resurrected life must be like. We know by observing Jesus' behavior after he was raised from the dead that he did all kinds of things. He ate, obviously he ate fish and he ate bread. He went through walls, they were in a locked room gathered, and poof, all of a sudden he's there, and then he's gone again. So he was able to, whatever, materialize, dematerialize. He could change his appearance apparently because Mary didn't recognize him. And when he's walking on the road to Emmaus with these two guys, they didn't know who he was because it said he changed the way he looked. So apparently he was able to change his appearance. He certainly had a physical body because Thomas said, unless I see those wounds and stick my hand, <laughs> I'm not going to believe that he's there. And he did. He obviously stuck his hand into something. 
Matter of fact, Mary was clinging to his feet outside of the, of the tomb when she saw him. He said, Mary, you got to let go of me. I haven't gone to the Father yet. So obviously he had a resurrected body. We know that Moses and Elijah were visible on the Mount of Transfiguration while Jesus was still alive. So these guys came back, and I don't know if they have name tags, you know, hi, I'm Moses, or hello, I'm <laughs> Elijah. I don't know how they knew. They didn't have pictures or whatever, but they knew. From time to time throughout scriptures, we're given a glimpse of a reality that's not our reality and yet intersects with our reality with people coming back and forth. And so we know there's something that's there. We know it's true. We know there's eternal beings that come and go. We have the entire book of Revelation, which I love reading. I don't understand a great deal of it, but I love it because it gives us a picture and view into a reality that I can't wait to see. And we know that something marvelous awaits the believers because of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I feel the exact same way sometimes, especially when God's dealing with me. The Scripture uses terms that we're pretty familiar with. And life and death are those, and that's what we're going to talk a lot about today. Paul gives us a picture of what we were like before Christ. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now, is now at work in the sons of disobedience. We were dead. We were walking around. We were breathing. But make no mistake, we were dead. We were away from life. We were dead. You don't know Christ in here today, you're dead, is what the scripture says. Your spirits are not alive. Our spirit was not alive. Our destination was more death. When we stepped out of this death into eternity, we were heading to more death. Here's a scary thought. We were going to spend all of eternity with death and hell. Wow. Paul goes on a few verses later and he says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We were dead, now we're alive. Those of us who have been born again are alive. We were dead. And it happened because of Jesus Christ. And not only are we just alive, barely making it, but Paul says we're seated with Him in heavenly places. What does all that mean? I don't know, but that sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. <laughs> We're seated with Christ in ruling and reigning, and we'll go there. Paul breaks it down in 1 Corinthians 15 very simply. He says, in Adam all die. You were born the first time, you were born into death, because Adam did that for us through his choice. But in Christ, we're made alive. Yeah. Life, death. We're, we're born into death, we're heading to more death, we're going to be eternally dead <laughs> with death. Or in Christ, we're born, in, we're born into death, we step into life and we are headed to eternal life. Man. What a difference. We're creatures of life now. In Christ, we're finally alive. <laughs> we're surrounded by death, we're surrounded by dead people that are walking around like you and I used to walk around before we met Christ, but we're alive. We have something that all those other people don't have, and that's called life. <laughs> they don't have it. They don't even know what it is. They can't grasp it. It doesn't make any sense to them. You're just like I am. You've got flesh, blood, you're breathing. How can you say you're alive? Because Jesus Christ is alive, I'm alive. And I'm heading to life. When we're born again, we step out of that kingdom of darkness and death into the kingdom of light and life. Those who reject Christ will continue on in this death here until they die and they'll head to a deeper darker death further away from the very presence of God the loving presence of God on my worst day here I hate to think what that's going to be like for people that will be away from life and away from life that will be eternally dead hopelessness beyond anything that can be imagined here the Bible uses terms like weeping and gnashing of teeth and I think that's pretty good that's pretty descriptive of what it must be like. We have life. And on our worst day here, we know we're heading to a place where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more heartache. Things are going to be made right. Things are going to be redeemed eternally. And we're going to have eternal life. That's something to live for. That's something to believe in. As I go through the Scripture, I see life and death everywhere. And I want to share just some 
verses with you today because of what happened with Jesus Christ and what happened today. John's ending up his gospel, John the Beloved. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. Many other signs. He raised the dead. He cast out lepers. He healed all sorts of disease. I mean, he did all kinds of things. But he said, He did many other things that aren't written in this book that I've written. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amazing. I wrote these things down, John says, so that you may believe in Jesus and you can have life. You don't have to live in death anymore. You can have life. John writes what Jesus said about himself. He said, this is my mission. This is what I've come for. You're used to living under the thief. (laughs) You're used to living in the kingdom of darkness, the prince of darkness, the sons of disobedience, his kingdom. But I came. He came to kill. He came to steal. I came that they may have life. And more abundantly, that they could have life. Not just some time off in the future, but now. Because when we meet Christ, we finally start entering into life. We start going a different direction. That's why he came, his mission. Life and death is the issue. Paul develops it in the book of Romans. He says, for if because of one man's trespass, and he's talking about Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Death, life. (laughs) Death, life. Adam unleashed death. Christ went to the cross, defeated death. And now life is here. And we enter into life because of what he did and what he has done on the cross through Jesus Christ. He explains what happens when we go through water baptism. He says, you're acting this thing out. You're you're identifying with Christ when you do this. He says, you were buried, therefore, with him in baptism into death. Jesus Christ died. He was put in the tomb. But he was raised again to a newness of life. And we we reenact that when we're in water baptism. It says, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in what? In newness of life. We walk in a new life. There was a point in time when I was dead, lost in my sins, headed for eternal damnation. I met the Lord and in that moment, everything changed. And I started heading now to life, eternal life. A newness of life. Everything becomes new. Everything begins to change. Is it perfect? No. Are there difficulties? Yes. But there's a new life, and it's in Christ. And we we just, we, we forget it. Paul later in that chapter says, look, the wages of sin is death. You were born in sin. The price is going to be paid. Those wages are going to be paid. It's death, both now and forever. He said, but... The free gift of God is what? It's eternal life in Christ. It begins the day we get saved here. The moment we are born again, eternal life begins. We receive it because of what Jesus did on the cross. Yes, we're surrounded with death. I got life. Do you? He explains in a couple chapters later, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you which means we've been born again, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. Life is evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. (laughs) Do we have life? Do we have eternal life? Do we have a hope within us? Do we know that life has, has happened to us? And if not, why not? What has happened? We've either been born again or we're not. We're in life or we're in death. We're headed to life eternal or we're headed to death eternal. The Holy Spirit's presence is evidence of life. My favorite book of the moment, since we're going through it. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Christ is our life. We died in Him. Now we've been raised in Him. Because of the resurrection. And when we appear, we'll appear with him in glory. First John even says, we don't know what we're going to be like, but we know we'll be like him. In glory. That's good news, isn't it? (laughs) That's good news. Whatever glorified Jeff's going to look like, it's going to look like Jesus. Yeah. Yeah.
an amazing sentence to me if you think about the context. In John 11, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> it's been four days he's been dead. And he goes, Jesus shows up purposely late. He says, I, I stayed away so that he would be good and dead, <laughs> my translation. He shows up. He's talking to Mary, who often gets a bum rap for being busy. But he says this to her as he's standing before wherever he's at at that point. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Amen. And yes, you're going to die here more than likely, but you'll live in me. Amen. Life and death. And he stands before the tomb. We know what happens. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And the, and the commentators and the, and the great preachers always say he had to put Lazarus' name in there because if he just said, come forth, everybody would come forth that was dead. And he commanded life to come back into Lazarus, and it did. But you know what? Lazarus died again later on at some point in his life. But he's alive now. <laughs> he's alive with the risen Christ. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. You believe in me, you're going to live. You are going to live. Do you know you're going to live in here today? <laughs> Boy, I do. Regardless of what happens here, if I go home this afternoon and get hit by a car and die this earthly death that I'm going to die here, I'm living forever with Christ. Amen. That's good news. In the great high priestly, priestly prayer, and I know this gets small, but he says, when Jesus had spoken these words... He lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh. What has he given him authority to do? To give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus has the authority to give eternal life. And the life centers in knowing the Father and the Son. Jesus said, Father, thank you for giving me this, this right to give eternal life. You and I have been given eternal life if you know Jesus. If you've been born again, you're on your path to eternal life. We are new creations in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. Amen. One more, 2 Timothy 1.10. He, he's talking about Jesus coming and the gospel and all that. And he says, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who abolished death, praise God for that, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The glorious good news of the gospel is we don't have to be dead anymore. We can step out of death into life. We do not have to be dead. We're dead in our sins and trespasses. In Christ we're alive because Jesus is alive. He defeated death. He's the firstborn of the dead, the first fruit of the dead, which means there's going to be more following in his wake because of what he did. You and I are part of that Amen. if you're born again. It's just he brought life and immortality through the gospel. Death has been abolished for the believer. Oh, death, where is your sting, we sang. Oh, death, where is your victory? You've been defeated. We celebrate this day because of what Christ did on that day, on the resurrection day. We're now children of life. We're able to live a life here that has meaning, and we're headed to eternal life because of what Jesus did. It doesn't get any better than that from my point of view, <laughs> no matter what we go through here. So I've got three questions for us here today. The first one is the most important, maybe. Are you in life here today? Have you stepped out of death into life? Are you now a child of life? Have you been born again? Are you part of the kingdom of Jesus? Are you part of the family of God? How, whatever terms you want to use, you're either dead or you're alive. Which one are you? Are you dead or are you alive? Are you alive in Christ or are you dead? in your sin and trespasses? Have you met the author of life? Are you a child of the king? Do you know what's going to happen to you if you drop dead? Before I'm done. <laughs> or later today or tomorrow. What's your final destination? Eternal life 
or eternal death? Do you know? Most of you in here do. I know you do. It's a good thing to review, think about. What if Jesus was really telling the truth? Rhetorical question, because he was. He said amazing things. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. None. Zero. Nada. Nobody. It's through me. What if he's right? Are we willing to bank our eternal soul on the fact that there might be another way? Are we going to take the Savior and the King of kings and Lord of lords at his word and say, I'm it. I'm the door. I'm the shepherd. I'm the only way. I'm it. <laughs> he is. This is the ultimate decision we make in our earthly life. It is the single greatest decision that's made for everyone. <laughs> so it's a good question to start with. Are you in life today? Are you there? If you're not, let's talk. Talk to somebody. Cry out to the author of life. Say, forgive me, cleanse me, save me. Here I am. I don't want to be dead anymore. I want life. And cry out to him. And he will do that. Most of us here are, are in life. Most of us are believers. That's why we're here. But some in here maybe have wandered away from life. Maybe you've made some choices that have taken you far off the path or maybe a little bit off the path, where you know you should be, and yet you've wandered off. You've become cold, indifferent, apathetic. Maybe you've got bound up in some sort of addiction or sin or something, and you just, you don't, you're not where you ought to be, and you know it. It's just that, that voice that's inside of you that's constantly saying, you know, you need to get right with God. You've wandered off. You've slipped. You've done this. You've done that. Come on. Come on back. The Father loves you. <laughs> He's waiting for you. Yes. What was the point of the prodigal son, if not the Father? Yes. <laughs> it's at least one of the points. He's looking for his son. His son went off and squandered everything and lived in riotous living and did all the things that he did. But he's looking and looking and looking and looking. And when he finally sees him turn, he finally humbles himself. He's finally done with his rebellion and his resistance to his father's love. And he turns to his father and says, I'm not even worthy to come back. What does the father do? Some of you in here think he runs to him and he gives him a lecture, he points his finger in his face and he beats him with a stick. That's not the word of God. That's not what he does. He doesn't say, okay, you've got to fly right now and you've got to jump through all these hoops and you've got to go on your knees for 40 days and, and I'm going to remind you constantly of how bad you smell with the pig stuff all over you. And he didn't do any of that. He runs to him. He says he saw him far off, he runs to him, he puts the robe around him, he puts the, finger, the ring on his finger, he throws a feast. Why? Because his father's heart was longing for him to come back. Yeah. Are you far from the Lord today? Have you wandered away from the Lord? Guess what? He's looking for you. Yeah. He's waiting for you to turn, yeah. to come to the end of what you're doing and, and the things you've chosen. Repentance begins with just turning around and looking back to the Father and saying, I'm, forgive me. I've been dumb. Take me back, please. Do you think he will? Yeah. Absolutely he will. He longs for you and he loves you. You're his child. What parent in here, when a child would turn in repentance, would say, Nick? And even if we would, even if we could be that heartless and cold, God isn't that way. God is love. He loves us. And he's waiting for us to turn to him. So do you know life today? Are you in life? Have you wandered away from life? And you're thinking, I don't know if I can go back. Yes, you can. You can come back. He loves you. And he's waiting for you. He wants to set you free. Maybe you haven't wandered off the path, but you feel like your life is just death right now. <laughs> this life stinks. This really is not a very good life. Jesus said, I came that you could have life and life abundantly, and frankly, my life stinks. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but some of you in here are going through major problems, major issues, real life pain, heartache, suffering, and difficulties. And you're going, oh, goody, another message on life. Yippee. 
my life stinks. Now, I don't have all the answers, obviously, but I knew, do know the author of life. And I do know there are reasons why things go on. I don't know all of them, but if you're struggling with life in here, maybe the Lord is trying to deal with some things. I'm not saying it is, but maybe there's something that, that we refuse to yield to Him. Maybe there's an area of our life where we say, you can be Lord of my life in every area, but not this one. <laughs> this one I keep. This is my pet. This is mine that I'm going to keep. And the Lord's saying, you know, our relationship just isn't going to be right till you let go of that. till you place that at my feet as well. I want to be Lord over your entire life. And, and our relationship just isn't going to be the way it should be until you let go of this. Maybe you've got bad doctrine. Maybe you're putting your father in the position of where God should be. And you have an image of what he's like. And so you're fearful. You feel like, I don't ever measure up. And I live in total fear of what God's going to do to me all the time. Or, or if I yield to God, I know He's sending me to Olathe or someplace. Okay, Africa or someplace. I know He's going to do that to me. And I don't want to yield my heart to Him because if I do, I know He's going to make me go be a missionary somewhere I don't want to be. God's not that way. God loves us. If, if He does call us to go somewhere, He will gift us and grace us to do it. <laughs> Maybe you've got a bad image of God. Maybe your theology is off on what you think God is or how He responds or how He reacts or what He expects or, or He's some tyrant up there. It's not the Bible picture of God. We need better doctrine. Maybe we just need an attitude adjustment. Have you ever had a bad attitude? You mean like since we started this morning? How easy it is, is it to slip into a really bad attitude? We just start grousing about stuff. You know, we follow that right down a hole. <laughs> We're down there wallowing around in this complaining, murmuring, bad attitude. The Bible's answer for that is rejoice in all things. Again, I say rejoice. Give thanks in every circumstance, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And you're going, oh, I don't know, I want to do that. I mean, tried that once, it didn't work. Is it just me that, that struggles with this kind of stuff? Or maybe we're self-focused instead of Christ-focused. We dwell so much on ourselves that we lose sight of the risen Christ. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's all about Him. It's what He's done. It's what He's going to do. And when I get my eyes on me, that's a pretty bad place because I just, I'm not Christ. And I can get very me-focused. And it can be, a, oh, I'm wonderful or, oh, I'm horrible. They're both me-focused. And I need to get my eyes off of me onto the risen Christ. I need to understand what his word says, and I need to apply it to my heart and life. Maybe we're being refined. Maybe your attitude's good and you're not self-focused and, and, and maybe none of those other things apply. As far as you know, there's no sin in your life and, and your doctrine's straight and right on as far as you know and, and, and yet God still has you in the furnace. <laughs> maybe He's refining you or me. Maybe He's polishing us up because He wants to prepare us for something. 2 Corinthians 1.5 talks about going through things so we can turn around and help other people later on. Maybe you're going through something to develop empathy for someone else. Maybe there's just issues going on where God's developing a, a deep character in your life. He wants, to, wants us to have patient endurance. It's a great character quality that He wants in our life. How do we get patient endurance? <laughs> Can't I just get poofed? Take a pill? Get a download, you know, okay, I'm now patiently enduring. Usually it doesn't work that way, does it? Usually we go through things to develop that. Maybe that's what God's after in our life. I don't know, it could be any of these. Maybe it's something else that I haven't thought of, but I do know that everything we go through has some sort of purpose. And God is redemptive and God is love. 
I do know that life is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. Right. I'm the way, the truth, the life. If you're in death today, if you're in darkness today, the answer is life. As I think about this day, I think of this. We need to come out of our tomb <laughs> into life. Some of us are in tombs of sin and self and envy and discontentment and addiction and pride and bitterness or whatever has us. The stone's been rolled away by the firstborn from the dead. He's rolled it away and he said, will you come out and follow me? What a cry. <laughs> My cry as well to me and to you. Stone's been rolled away. Will we walk in newness of life? We can. Yeah. We can leave here today different yeah. than how we came in here today. That's good news. That's yeah. the power of the gospel. Thank you, Lord. So if you're in here today and you don't know Christ, don't leave here until you do. Right. If you're in here today and you've wandered off the path and you're going, I, I don't even know how to get back, or I don't know if he'd want me back, I have messed up so much. I've done so many things. Man, what, what's the story of David about, if not redemption? Saul murdered people. <laughs> Became a chosen servant of God. If he didn't murder him directly, he certainly was a party to it. Drag him off and put him into prison for just being believers, and yet God used him totally. <laughs> You've not wandered too far from the love and grace of God. You can come back. And if you're going through the fire today, will we get our eyes off of the fire and put them on the Lord yeah. where they belong? All of these things are possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is what we celebrate today.